As difficult as it was for me, I have come to an inescapable and profoundly disturbing conclusion. I believe that an elite group of people and the corporations they run have gained control over not just our energy, food supply, education, and health care, but over virtually every aspect of our lives. And they do it by controlling the world of finance, not by creating more value, but by actually controlling the source of money. When I followed the money, I found that it took me up the levels of a pyramid. Here we are at the bottom level going about our daily lives. Above us is government, people who are given a monopoly on force and use it to tax and control us whether or not we agree. But who controls them? At the next level are the corporations. Many would say that it is now corporations and not nation states that rule the world. They call it a corporatocracy. To acquire the world's resources and control the markets, this corporatocracy must have access to cheap money. The big corporations get their loans at special rates from the big banks, which means that those who control the major banks, the moneyed elite, ultimately control the corporations. As I've followed the money, I've learned that almost everything I once believed about money is simply not true. It's um, interesting how few questions we actually ask about very everyday things like when we go into a bank and we ask for a loan of say fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand pounds what actually happens you see most people live their lives based on a kind of vague image of what happens what actually happens is you ask for fifty thousand pounds they type into your account fifty thousand pounds that's all they do they don't uh, mint any coins they don't print any money they don't move any precious metal anywhere they just put fifty thousand pounds into your account on a computer screen from that moment you start paying interest on money that has never does not and will never exist it turns out that banks actually have about nine times as much money loaned out as they have on reserve in their vaults this is possible because of what's referred to as fractional reserve lending. The way it works is that the Federal Reserve, or the central bank in any country, is legally allowed to determine the amount a bank must have on reserve. In the U.S., it's currently around 10%. So if you deposit $10,000 into the bank, the bank sets aside 10%, or $1,000, and then loans out the rest of your money. The way it works is, say another person comes into the bank and asks for a car loan of $9,000. At this moment, the bank loans out the $9,000 from your original deposit. It isn't there anymore. The borrower then pays the person selling the car, and they go deposit the money into another bank, which is part of the same central banking system. This $9,000 is treated as a new deposit, and the process continues. The money gets redeposited and reloaned until the initial deposit of $10,000 becomes $100,000. The banking system just created $90,000 by loaning out your money. Apparently it began with the goldsmiths in the 17th century when people were trading in gold. Gold was heavy to carry around so people stored the actual metal in vaults and traded receipts instead. Those receipts were the first paper money. Since only a few people would withdraw their gold at any given time, the vault owners, basically the new bankers, began creating receipts for more metals than they actually held. They loaned out those receipts and charged interest on money, gold, that they didn't really have. That's how our so-called fractional reserve system was born. In this system, the bankers get to make up money out of nothing while the rest of us have to work hard to earn it. It has created a modern form of serfdom where the mass of society is now working to pay off their debt to the banks. Under this fractional reserve scheme, we inevitably become debt slaves to a ruling class of financial elite, not because they are better or smarter than anyone else, but because they have rigged the system 
to benefit themselves at the expense of most people on the planet. Catherine Austin Fitz is an expert on this issue. She was an assistant secretary of housing and urban development under President George Bush Sr. and then an advisor to the Clinton administration. Let's set up a game of Monopoly and you want to buy Park Place. Um, what I can continually do is just print money, give myself more money, lower the value of your money by printing more. No matter how hardworking you are or how successful you are, I can always end up buying you for free. So how come if you or I make up money, it's called counterfeiting? But if the banks do it, it's increasing the money supply. How did the banks get this power? This is Jekyll Island, where in 1910, representatives from the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, Morgans, and other private bankers gathered secretly to draft the legislation that would create the Federal Reserve. Ed Griffin literally wrote the book on what happened at Jekyll Island. Central banks are banking cartels which have gone into partnership with the respective governments in the countries where they operate. And they've been given monopolistic power over the creation of the nation's money supply. That's what the politicians handed to them as a gift, you might say, for the partnership. Now, in return, what did the bankers do for the politicians? They promised to create money out of nothing, now that they've got this legal power to do it, any time the government needs it. And since 2008, we've witnessed the greatest fake money printing run in recorded history. This financial sleight of hand disguises the costs, hides who's to blame, and leaves us as debt slaves working to pay off the bill. I found it revealing that in the same year the Federal Reserve was founded, 1913, the Internal Revenue Service was also established. An income tax was then instigated so you and I would have to pay the politicians' debt plus interest to the bankers. The problem is we have a privately owned central bank system uh, in the United States disguised as a government-owned system. Now, if you look in the, the uh, uh, telephone book here in the Washington, D.C. area, um, you look up for Federal Reserve in the blue government pages, it's not there. It's in the white pages right next to Federal Express. It's a privately owned central bank. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. We have a private bank that prints money on behalf of the Treasury. The Federal Reserve prints money on a debt-based system which creates scarcity. But it puts a group of insiders in a position of having access to all the data about the economy when we don't. So you have a, a small group of bankers who understand the data on how the money works in the economy, and it gives them the ability to print money in a way that the insiders are protected and everybody else is drained. Catherine went on to compare a healthy economy to a vibrant torus, balanced, freely flowing, and energized throughout, in contrast to what's happening in our current economy. What, what you have is, uh, is a system that's very dynamic, and it's trying to optimize. Um, but, but intertwined in the core of it, you have a tapeworm. The way a tapeworm works in your body is it injects a chemical into your body that makes you crave what's good for the tapeworm and bad for you. You have a parasite that's, that's very much manipulating and engorging itself at, at the expense of the whole. We live in a tapeworm economy where the financial elite are the tapeworm and they're feeding on us. And they don't like it when people blow their cover. After Catherine began exposing government corruption at the highest levels, the FBI raided her company and seized its assets. She was dragged through the courts for 10 years before being found innocent. So we've got the Federal Reserve, a privately owned corporation with a monopoly on creating money, 
but with no accountability, backed up by a government with a monopoly on force. The country got sold on the Fed as an institution that would help stabilize the economy and remain independent of politics. But in fact, in close to a century of existence, the Federal Reserve has done just the opposite. Since they took charge, we've been robbed through inflation, and the purchasing power of the dollar has declined more than 96%. And the wealth gap makes it clear most of the money is going to a very few. Only 16 years after the Federal Reserve was in power, America experienced the Great Depression. My research revealed that before the big crash in 1929, the elite bankers pulled their money out of the stock market. After the crash, they used that money to buy up cheap stocks and smaller failing banks for pennies on the dollar. Among the bankers who consolidated their wealth this way were the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Morgans. A similar scenario played out in the 2008 financial collapse with the same bankers benefiting. In the years leading up to the collapse, the biggest banks, including Bank of America, Citigroup, and Chase, controlled by the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Morgans, were bundling and trading bad loans that they knew would eventually fail. It's like putting rotten oranges in a box and selling them as grade AAA. The bundlers of the debt knew it was only a matter of time before someone would open that box and see that the content was worthless, since they were the ones who packed the boxes in the first place. When the rotten oranges, what we hear about as unsound loans, derivatives, and credit default swaps were finally discovered, everyone was impacted. People lost their homes, their jobs, their businesses, and their retirements. Meanwhile, the biggest banks who created the problem in the first place were the ones who got bailed out. Why is that? Why would the Federal Reserve give trillions to the banks, even though the majority of Americans were against bailing them out? And why not help those most in need rather than the perpetrators of the financial collapse? My research led me to believe that the same people who created the Federal Reserve, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans, still control it, and they use this scheme to bail themselves out at our expense. Many of the banks created are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill, uh, and they frankly own the place. I'm convinced that the near collapse of the economy in 2008 resulted from an orchestrated pump and dump scheme designed and executed by the big bankers to consolidate wealth and power. David Icke explains how he sees the Federal Reserve rigging the so-called business cycles. Stage one, it's like throwing a fishing line out. Stage one, you put lots of money, units of exchange, into circulation. You do this by pushing interest rates down, by making lots of loans. This is the part of the cycle we call a boom. Because there's lots of units of exchange in circulation, there's lots of money changing hands. That generates lots of economic activity. That generates jobs. And as more and more money is spent, there's more demand, so companies take out more loans of fresh air money to increase their production. People get confident in their everyday lives. Hey, you know, I work for this company. They've got lots of orders. Ah, it's really going great. My job's safe. I tell you what, we can have a bigger house. Then they start to change it. What they do is they pull the fishing line in. They push interest rates up. Now, fewer people, um, A, um, are taking out loans and they make the criteria for having a loan from the bank stronger anyway. And also, now, as interest rates have gone up, a larger part of people's income is going to pay back the extra interest and not being circulated in buying things. Suddenly, there's nothing like as much money in circulation, and therefore, fewer things are being bought. Companies start to go down in terms of their profits. They start to shed jobs and they start to go out of business. 
People lose their jobs, they can't pay the mortgage anymore of the big house they took out in the good times. Now what the banks are doing is starting to reel the fishing line in because as they go bankrupt, companies and individuals, the banks get the real wealth, the property, the land, the resources that they had signed to them for lending merely figures on a screen. Now this economic cycle of fishing line out, fishing line back, lots of units in circulation pull them in, has been going on for centuries. And what it's done, it's stolen and accumulated the real wealth of the world in the hands of the few. At the international level, central bankers use the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to make more money while exploiting the resources of countries they lend to, bankrupting them in the process. The Central Bank of Central Banks is the Rothschild-created Bank for International Settlements.